One of the advantages of married life is that you have somebody there to remind you of things. Am I right? Yeah. Honey, can you take the trash out? <laughs> Honey, can you clean the bathtub? Honey, there's a pile of clothes on the floor. Could you pick those up? And, you know, it works the other way, too. I'm just naming off my sins because I don't want to, you know, cast aspersions upon my spouse up here. But I definitely need those reminders. I'm sure you do, too. One of the things that she doesn't often say is, Honey, did you remember to schedule that tea time with Lewis? <laughs> I don't forget that, <laughs> apparently. And neither do you. And the point of that is that we all remember the things that are very important to us. The things that really are impactful to our lives, things that we want to accomplish, our goals, our desires, we remember those things and we don't typically need to be told the things that we love to do and we want to do. Uh, but it's the other things in life, you know, the chores, the reminders to um, go this go to this doctor's appointment with this child or to run this child to this sports practice or whatever the case might be, it's, it's often the, the ordinary things of life that we have a hard time forgetting. And modern technology has tried to aid this in every way possible. In fact, if you have a, a smartphone, probably you have a reminders app on your smartphone that you can set to remind you of certain things at a certain time every single day. And let me tell you, I use that and I still forget, okay? And I'm setting this all up this way because when it comes to the Word of God, the Word of God should have a huge priority in our life, but oftentimes we forget, don't we? We forget the things that we should do according to the Word of God. And so as Peter is writing this letter to the, the church there, and he's considering the fact that this is probably the final communication he is going to have with them. He finds it necessary to remind the church that it's good to be reminded. And so I would consider it a blessing to have men who are willing to bring faithful reminders to bear upon your life from the Word of God. Peter certainly considered it a blessing. I'm sure his original audience considered a blessing, and we, too, should consider it a blessing. Look at the text with me now. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will also be diligent, that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. As we consider the four verses that are before us this morning, I want to draw your attention to the main theme, in my opinion, of this passage. And it is this, that we should be thankful for teachers who faithfully remind us from God's word. We should be thankful for teachers who faithfully remind us from God's word. Now, there's nothing in this text that says be thankful. But there is an exhortation to be reminded. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know, Peter is wanting to remind his readers. Peter is wanting them to want to be reminded. And what should that produce in my heart? In my heart, that should produce thankfulness. It should produce thankfulness that somebody is willing to remind me of the truth time and time and time again. Now let's examine who should these reminders come from. Well, according to verse 12, these reminders come from faithful teachers. Peter, in verse 12, begins with the word, therefore. He's drawing a conclusion from all that he has written previously, verses 1 through 11. And the conclusion is this, therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things. 
Again, we've been dealing with this phrase, these things, for the last three weeks, and Peter mentions it at least four times in verses 1 through 12. And the these things that he is referring to are the truths of God's word. That's the content of these things. Specifically, specifically in chapter 1 of this letter, he's talking about the faith that we have received according to God's gracious gift. In verse 3, Peter's reminding us of the fact that God has given us, through his divine power, everything we need to live a life of godliness and pertaining to spiritual growth. Now, in verses 5 through 7, Peter has instructed us about the character virtues that we need to develop if we are indeed in the faith. And verses 10 and 11, which we covered last week, challenge us to be diligent, okay, to make every effort to confirm that we are indeed saved. The, this, what I just mentioned to you, are the these things. But I would suggest Peter's going even further. He's going to go even further, and he's including the rest of the book as well. Peter wants to remind us of these things. Well, what is a reminder? A reminder, then, is something that is brought to the forefront of your thinking. And you are forced to think about that particular topic or subject again. In my opening example, um, I can be told in the morning to take out the trash, but then maybe I, I get busy thinking about the to-do list that I have to accomplish for work, and I forget about the trash because it's not a high priority for me at that moment. Well, the reminder brings that to my attention again, right? Not in a rude way, not in a condescending way, but just, hey, remember you were supposed to do this. That's what this reminder is supposed to do for you. Now, it should be obvious why we need reminders, but I'm going to give you some additional reasons why you need them, okay? Number one, we are forgetful. We just have short-term memory, okay? Short-term memory loss. We are often weak. We are easily distracted, and we are easily deceived about what things are important. Those are some reasons why we need reminders. We're forgetful, we're weak, we're easily distracted and easily deceived. Now, the, the, the blessing of the reminder is this. It assumes that you know something, but you just need to have it said to you again. It's not saying you're ignorant or that you're without knowledge, but you just need to have it brought to the forefront of your attention again. And so Peter is willing to do that for these saints that he is writing to. And in the context of this letter, Peter is the faithful teacher who is reminding the saints. And so this next point really, I think, pertains to myself, to the other pastors here at the church, um, to the faithful men who teach on a regular basis, we must follow Peter's example in being willing to remind the saints over and over and over again concerning God's truth. Peter says this about himself, verse 12, I will always be ready to remind you of these things. This means that Peter is not going to grow tired, he's not going to become frustrated, and he's not going to grow annoyed at the responsibility that he has been given to bring truth to the forefront of the thinking of God's people. And this is, this is challenging in our, in our humanity, because you think to yourself, I've told you this 50 times, why do I need to tell it to you 51? Why do I need to tell it to you 52? Well, we're frail. We're weak, we're easily distracted, and we need the reminders that come from God's word. And so as a shepherd, it's my duty, and it's the duty of the other shepherds in this local church to bring the word of God to the forefront of your attention time and time and time again. That's why we preach and we focus on preaching the gospel the exposition of God's word week in and week out. And I know many of you in the audience, you're faithful. You, you come nearly every week, hardly ever miss. But if I quizzed you on what truths I taught six months ago from this pulpit, would you pass? I see some worried looks out there. <laughs> 
It's true. I'd have a hard time passing my own quiz. <laughs> this is why it's important to bring a reminder of God's truth week in and week out, month after month, year over year, so that God's people can grow and mature and bring to the forefront these truths that sustain us during the most challenging times of life and that give us great joy and comfort when things are going well. Now, every believer is in need of this reminder. Look at in this text again. Every believer needs this reminder. Look at the personal nature of Peter's writing. I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right to stir you up by way of reminder. Verse 15, I will be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. Who is Peter's focus regarding the reminder? It's the sheep. It's the sheep, the flock of God, the saints of God, those who have re been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are the ones who need this reminder. He's not saying that you need the reminder because you're ignorant. He says, you already know these truths. He agrees that his readers have been established in the truth. This is the second part of verse 12. You know the truths and you've been established in the truth. And Peter is affirming that his readers have a high level of theological understanding. In other words, what he was telling them was not new. It was if we could use a phrase that seems so crass, it was a retread. It was something that you are learning again for the second time or the third time or the fourth time. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason. Even though you know the truth and you have been firmly established in the truth, you need the reminder for what I've already said, our frailty, but also if we take it out of the realm of our personal limitations, we must be aware that there is an enemy who wants to derail what you know about God and how you practice the truth. And again, Peter is setting up the arguments in chapter 2 about false teachers and how to avoid false teachers and how to recognize false teachers. He's saying, be reminded of the truth because there are going to be Streams of information that come into your consciousness. Streams of information that come into your orbit. And you're going to have to decide, am I going to trust this or not? Am I going to follow this or not? It doesn't matter how theologically capable you are. It doesn't matter how many times you've read the scriptures. It doesn't matter how many hours you spend in seminary or sitting in Sunday school class or listening to godly preaching, the danger of false teaching and the allure of false doctrine is powerful. And if you were to come up to myself or Pastor Keith or Pastor John or uh, Pastor Ron after the service and say, hey, brothers, do you know testimonies of pastors who have been taken captive by false teaching? We could all say yes, right? We could. We could. And so there is no, um, there's no lack of need for this. We need it immensely. And it's not just because of our own internal frailties. It's because of the dangers and the arrows that are being flung our way by the evil one. He wants to derail the saints he wants to take us captive with false teaching. So what? So we become ineffective for Christ. It doesn't mean that we'll lose our salvation. We've already talked about that. You can't lose your salvation. But you could become an ineffective Christian because you have been swept up by false teaching. Now think about this. If the men and women of the first century who were so close to Jesus and so close to the apostles were taken captive by false teaching, 
Do you somehow think that we are stronger than they? I don't think so. In fact, I think the danger of false teaching is even greater today because of the ease of access that we have to information and the proliferation of all kinds of false teaching since the first century. We need to be even more on guard against how some people have taken the truth and they have blended it with deceit or lie and they are now presenting it as a new truth. We need to be even more aware of that. How are you going to be aware of that? Well, you're going to be aware of that by knowing the truth. You're going to hear a teaching and you're going to say, man, something doesn't sound right. Something is slightly off. I can't put my finger on it, but this isn't right. And you know what? After further investigation, maybe a further conversation with somebody else who's also a strong believer who knows the Word of God, you might come to the understanding and the recognition of where the error is in that teaching. That may happen for you. And so we must be reminded regularly of the truth because of our own frailty and because of our own, uh, the attacks that we will face as we encounter living in a sin-cursed world. Now, when we think about the fact that we need reminders, we should not uh, be down on ourselves. Okay? I don't want you to come away discouraged thinking, oh man, I'm, I'm just so weak, I'm so frail, I can't do anything. No, the pattern and the provision and the establishment of reminders has been something that God has done for his people all throughout the centuries. Think about it. What was one of the first reminders that God gave to all mankind? It was the rainbow. When you saw that rainbow in the sky, what were you to think? No more flood. God will never destroy the entire earth with a flood ever again. And even today, here we are, thousands of years removed from that, we still are reminded about that truth because of the rainbow. Now to Abraham and his descendants, God gave the symbol of circumcision to remind them that they were a chosen people and that God had made promises to Abraham that he was going to keep. To the nation of Israel, God gave two tablets of stone and on those tablets were the entire law summarized in ten statements. They weren't the entirety of the law, but they were the summary of the law. And if you could keep those things, you would be keeping the law. Why did Israel need those written down? They needed a reminder. Even Jesus himself understood that the church, even though we have many advantages and blessings that the nation of Israel then had, the church itself needs a reminder What's the reminder that he left for us? We're going to practice it today. The threefold communion service. It's a reminder of the past, the present, and the future ministry that Jesus Christ did on our behalf. In the past, he justified us through his death on the cross. In the present, he's sanctifying us as we continue to put off sinful habits and put on godly habits. And in the future, he will glorify us where we will Having stood before the Bema seat, we will have received a righteous pronouncement. We will have received the rewards. We will be given linen cloths that are white, and we will partake in the marriage supper of the Lamb. The church itself needs a reminder. Therefore, my friends, we should become humble that we may willingly and graciously accept the reminders that are brought to us by those whom God has given to teach us. Now, it's one thing to get a reminder, but if you don't take action, what good does that do to you? It doesn't do much good. And so Peter doesn't just say you need the reminder. In verse 13, he talks about the purpose of these reminders. And these reminders are to lead to renewed action action in the life of the believer. Look at verse 13. He says this, I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent 
as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. So Peter, in writing this to the saints, feels a sense of obligation to remind the saints of these truths. The word right in verse 13 is the Greek word diakonon, which means right, righteous, or just. It is often used, often describes the moral condition of an action, namely whether the action is a just action or an unjust action. And here, this is a just action and it requires, an act, it requires follow through on the part of Peter. We would call this a moral obligation. Peter is morally obligated to bring this reminder to the saints. This is more than just a personal conviction. If he were not to do this, it would be sin. That's how serious Peter is about the need to remind the saints of God's truth. And so as a shepherd of God's sheep and as one who is charged to teach them, I can say this, along with Peter, I have a moral obligation to preach to you the word of God and only the word of God and to remind you of God's truth. And my fellow elders have the same obligation. When they stand in this pulpit or when they teach on a Wednesday evening or in a Sunday school class or in any other setting, we have a moral obligation before the Lord Jesus Christ to teach the truth and to bring it to your attention. And I know this, I know that even though I am morally obligated to do this, there are times when I fail. There are times when I feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit to cause me to say something and I make a justification for why I shouldn't say that. I reason it away. I think somebody else will take care of that. Or this, this person has already heard. Or this situation has already been dealt with. And I know, and I know that you felt it too. I know you felt it too because many of you have told me that in personal conversations that you've had, you felt the Holy Spirit prompting you to speak God's truth and you failed in those situations. Now, thankfully, we succeed a lot, but we do fail. And so we need to be mindful even of our own frailty as those who teach God's word that we don't always do the reminders perfectly. But we must. We must strive to fulfill the obligation that we have as teachers of God's word, as saints redeemed by Christ, to speak God's word whenever we have the opportunity. God's word is the power to change people's lives. Not my own opinion, but God's word. And so let us remember that together. Now, in Peter's situation, he not only felt a sense of obligation, but also a sense of urgency. Look at verse 14. I'm going to skip the second half of 13 for a moment. I'm going to come back to that. But look down at verse 14. He says this in verse 14. Knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made it clear to me. Peter, as he was writing this letter, knew that his ministry on earth was rapidly drawing to a close. He was probably recalling the prophecy that Jesus made to him in John chapter 20, where Jesus prophesied about the death that Peter would one day die. If I just, I'll read this to you. You don't have to turn here, but John chapter 20, verses 18 and 19, here's what Jesus said. And these were some of the last words of Jesus to Peter. So you can imagine that they were powerful. Uh, John chapter 20, I'm sorry, John chapter 21, I wrote down the wrong verse. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. John was recording the words that Jesus spoke to Peter. And so Peter knew that his ministry on earth was drawing to an end. We don't know whether Peter could discern the circumstances that he was in and knew that he wasn't getting out, or whether 
Perhaps Jesus appeared to him in a special vision and said, now is the time for this prophecy to become fulfilled. We don't know. But what we do know is that Peter understood that this would be probably his last communication to this church while he lived in the flesh. And so not only did he feel a sense of obligation, he felt a sense of urgency. The text, in the text he says, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent. Is imminent. This is a, what we call a euphemism. All right, this is a, a euphemism is a, a polite way to say something that is difficult. So the difficult thing is Peter saying, I'm going to die. That's going to happen to me. I'm about to die. But by saying it this way, the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, that kind of softens it a little bit for the reader. But it also communicates something, that everybody has an earthly dwelling, this body, and we don't know the day of our death. We don't know. And so sometimes using a euphemism helps to communicate more than just the main point. And in this case, I think it was. I think Peter was asking his readers to consider their own mortality as he used this phrase. Peter had a sense of obligation to his readers. He felt a sense of urgency because of the time that he had remaining. And finally, he tells his readers what they should do as a result of the reminder. He says, reminders should cause you to take action. Look back with me at verse 13. The goal, Peter's purpose in writing, is to stir you up by way of reminder. To stir you up, to get you moving, as if you're a pitcher and you're trying to mix liquids together and you pour one liquid in and another liquid in and they don't really combine very fast. But if you stir them up, they combine much quicker. In the same way, Peter is trying to stir your heart to action. He wants you to do something as a result of the reminder. What do we take from this? What do we take from this? Here's what I took, and I think this is what Peter's communicating. Nowhere in the New Testament do we find the apostles or Jesus or any of the other teachers advocating for the mere, how shall I say it, gain of intellectual knowledge. Nowhere do they advocate for just gaining knowledge without doing something. Unfortunately, we have theological studies programs in the evangelical church that in some ways advocate for just gaining all kinds of knowledge about the scriptures, all kinds of knowledge about theology. And there's not an emphasis on how you use that knowledge to grow in godliness. Peter is saying, I am reminding you of these intellectual truths so that you will grow in godliness. You need to be transformed by the knowledge that you have gained. You need to be transformed by the knowledge that you have gained. And in my experience as a pastor, this is the hardest step for most people. How do I take a truth and allow them to transform my character and my interactions with other people? I was talking with a brother yesterday, and he shared a story of me of a friend he knows. And the, this friend was really able to recall Scripture, really great at quoting Scripture. But then you say, well, how do you put that into practice? Or what's the big picture? Or how do you, how do you actually do what you quoted? And the, this particular gentleman who was being referenced was at a loss. So it's, it's one thing to know Scripture. It's one thing to memorize Scripture. It's another thing to take that truth and to put it into practice so that it has a powerful effect in your life and in the life of your family and in the effect that you have on the community at large. 
Paul communicates this when he says in Romans 12 too, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. We, uh, we don't prove the will of God by memorizing the scriptures, although that's good. And I think that's one of Peter's main points here is you should memorize the scriptures. But in, in addition to memorizing the scripture, we need to learn how to practice the truth that God has revealed. Uh, take a moment and turn over to Colossians chapter 3 with me. Colossians chapter 3. Here's how, here's how Paul talks about this exact principle. Okay, he's talking about, you know the truth, but here's how to do it in life. Okay, verse 5, Colossians 3, 5. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amount to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. Here's what Paul says to do. Look, if you've been saved by the power of Jesus Christ through the free gift of salvation offered by God, then you need to put to death immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. How do you mortify those things in your life? Well, you look at your life and you say, where am I being immoral? Where am I struggling with immoral thoughts or actions? Where am I being impure? Do I let my passions run wild and rule me or am I ruling my passions? Evil desires. Do I have evil desires, desires that are contrary to God's truth? Do I have greed? And if you have any of those things, then you need to stop doing them. That's putting the truth into practice. Now, Peter, or Paul, excuse me, in, in Colossians chapter 3, gets even more personal, gets even more specific. Verse 8, But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. James wrote in James chapter 3 that the tongue is a flaming fire. It is difficult to control. Who can master it? And Peter is, or Paul is saying here, here's the sins of the tongue. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech. Stop those things. Stop those things. You want to put the truth into practice? Stop being angry. Having angry outbursts. Stop being wrathful. Stop having malice towards one another. Stop slandering other people and stop speaking abusive speech. Verse 10, put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. The reminders, if you go back to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, the reminders that Peter is bringing to our attention should lead to this type of action which results in godliness in our lives. That we imitate Jesus. That we represent Jesus well. That by representing Jesus well, God the Father gets the glory. Not me. I don't need the glory. I shouldn't want the glory. God the Father gets the glory. And the way that we accomplish this was already mentioned by Peter in the list of godly virtues he says we should grow in. Uh, chapter 1, verse 6. And in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, not godliness. We must practice self-control in order to apply the truth. It takes effort Diligence to think about the areas in which you still sin and to think of strategies in which to kill that sin or mortify that sin so that you are no longer sinning in those ways. We must break the habit of sin in our life and we must establish a new godly habit. This is called the process of sanctification. 
And the action that we are to take is the result of the reminders. You know, sin affects every area of life. And because we are finite and frail beings, there are some times that we're working on a particular sin, working on a particular area of life, and sometimes something else crops up. I've heard described multiple times that putting to death sin in your life is like playing the game whack-a-mole. You hit one mole over here, and then another mole pops up over there. And you hit that one, and then another one pops up. And you hit that one, and another one pops up. And it can really feel like that. And it's really true. As you begin working on sin, Satan is not pleased with that. And so he brings greater attack against you. He brings more temptation into your life. He wants to see you crack and become discouraged and frustrated and say, I give up. Just let the moles live there. I'll pretend like they don't exist. No, no, we can't do that. We need to be reminded of these truths and we need to take action. And so the reminder from God's word is what stirs us to take an act, this action. Unfortunately, if we're being very frank and honest, some of us are just lazy. Some of us just know that we should take action, but we don't. And that's why it's important for me and my fellow pastors and all the teachers in this church to stir you by way of reminder. We're bringing truths to bear on your life. Sometimes there's times that I preach and somebody will come and say to me, uh, Pastor, did you know I was struggling with this because you preached about it today? And I said, no, I didn't know that. But guess who did? The Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit convicted your heart and told you you needed to change. That wasn't me. I didn't know that. The Holy Spirit did. But the Holy Spirit used the truth to stir you to action. Finally, Peter has a third purpose for giving reminders. And it is this, that reminders prepare us for future spiritual battles. Look at verse 15. Peter says this, I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to, to mind. Unfortunately, I have a lifespan. I don't know how long that's going to be. Pastor Keith, Pastor John, Pastor Ron, Pastor Dave, he's not here this morning. They have lifespans too. God does, we don't know how long it's going to be, only God does. And we saw within the last 10 days that a faithful brother was taken from a human perspective before his time. And so because I don't have a lot of time, I need to make the most of my time. And so I'm going to spend the time that I have with you teaching you God's truth and imploring you to obey it. Peter knew that he didn't have a long time. And so he was going to be diligent to teach them and to prepare them. Again, we looked at this word diligent last week, but to remind you, see, there we go, reminder. To remind you what it means, it means to be eager to work hard at something. To be eager to work hard at something. Peter was going to be diligent to work hard to remind the saints so that when he died, the saints would be prepared. Look at the second part of verse 15. So that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. He wants the saints to be able to bring to their own remembrance the truths that he has taught them. This is not the mere regurgitation of facts that you would do for a test, but this is a true reliance upon Scripture, a true, deep-seated, genuine knowledge of the Word of God and how to put it into practice. And Peter wanted to do this for a specific reason, okay? Peter did this because there are spiritual battles to be fought, there are spiritual battles to be fought. The better you do at learning and knowing God's word, the more capable you are in being able to recall it to mind in different circumstances and situations, the more prepared you are for the battle that you must participate in. We have both external and internal battles to fight as Christians. External battles are extinguishing the flaming arrows of the evil one when Satan and his demons try to attack you. And another external battle would be 
resisting the temptations that appeal to our sinful flesh as we live in a sin-cursed world. Those are external battles, but we have internal battles as well. There is a war that goes on in our mind regarding temptation, lust, and obedience. Galatians 5, 16 and 17 says this, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh, for the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Don't be ignorant of the battle. Don't be ignorant of the need to call God's truth to the forefront of your mind as you fight the battle. That is your primary tool. The word of God is your offensive weapon to fight this battle. Peter says that you will be ready at any time. He wants you to be prepared. Be ready at any time. You don't know when you'll have to confront false teaching. You don't know when you'll have to confront personal temptation. You don't know when you'll have to share truth or encourage a fellow believer. But if you know the truth, if you've been taking action, if you've been willing to sit under the, re the faithful teaching of faithful shepherds, these things will come to the forefront of your mind quickly and you will be ready. So in response to Peter's message, I want to ask you a few questions. Number one, is there a truth that God keeps trying to remind you of, but you're not listening? Is there a truth that God keeps trying to remind you of, but you're not listening? Humble yourself. Acknowledge the truth. Do what's right. Secondly, what is your attitude towards reminders? Are you annoyed? Do you think you don't need them? Are you arrogant? Boastful? Or do you humbly accept them? Are you appreciative of them? What is your attitude towards reminders? And finally, is there a particular area that God has brought to your mind this morning, a reminder that you need to grow in. Perhaps you, like we read about in Colossians chapter 3, need to work on some of the sins of the tongue. Perhaps you need to become more patient. Perhaps you need to work on growing in the godly characteristics that Peter mentioned in verses 5 through 7. I think everyone should think of one area of personal application, a truth that has been brought to your attention this morning that you need to grow in. And then you need to make a plan to actually grow in that particular truth. I have to say, it's a blessing to be able to study God's word week in and week out. And as I study God's word, I am reminded of areas of my life that I need to improve. And I want to make sure that as a faithful shepherd, and I, I know I speak for my fellow elders as well, that we are growing in God's truth in our, its practice as much as its knowledge. And that's how we should all be when we are confronted by the truth of the word of God. Let's pray together.